Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, welcome to part one of my lecture on chapter 14, Non-Renewable Energy. Uh, we have about 57 slides to this uh, chapter, so this will be done in two parts, part one now, uh, and we'll do part two later. So again, make sure to uh, watch both parts uh, of my lecture. Again, chapter 14, Non-Renewable Energy, and here we go with part one. All right, so we start off with a core case study talking about using hydrofracting to produce oil and natural gas. So what is hydrofracking? Well, oil and natural gas is trapped between compressed layers of shale rock formations. So if you remember, um, shale rock is a, uh, is, is a rock that is in layers, and so what happens is uh, this gas is trapped in between the layers, and then as the layers uh, compress and compact upon one another to form the shale rock, uh, the natural gas uh, is uh, an oil is actually trapped between those compressed layers of shale rock. So what happens is we have uh, something known as horizontal drilling or hydraulic fracturing. That's the hydrofracting uh, you hear about in the news. And basically this is when you pump water, sand, and chemicals into those cracks, which then allows the cracks to break open uh, or into the cracks in the rock, allowing the rock to break and then you can retrieve the oil or natural gas that was trapped between the compressed layers of rock. So again, horizontal drilling just drills right down while, while his hydrofracking, again, puts in water, sand, or chemicals into the cr uh, cracks. Unfortunately, though, that pr does produce a hazardous waste slurry uh, that, again, has to uh, then be, uh, be dealt with, uh, be disposed of. So you'll notice here, uh, again, this is what we're talking about uh, when we talk about this uh, this, this uh, hydrofracking. Uh, basically, we're sending down in the oil and natural gas in this shale rock, right? We send down these uh, these these pumps that then fracture the rock, basically uh, somehow fracture the rock, and then allows us then to extract, right, uh, the oil or gas. So water and sand goes down, cracks the rock releases the gas or the oil, which then is collected uh, back up at the top. So that's basically what uh, this is all about. Uh, again, you hear a lot about it in the news, especially uh, across the border in Pennsylvania. They have a lot of this going on because they have a lot of uh, oil and natural gas uh, uh, trapped in the shell rock under under the state of Pennsylvania. And so you hear a lot about this hydrofracking, and we'll talk more about it uh, as we go through these slides. So what types of energy resources do we use? Well, 90% of the commercial energy used in the world comes from non-renewable resources. And again, what do we consider non-renewable resources? Resources that cannot renew themselves in a person's lifetime. So again, oil, natural gas, and coal do renew themselves, but over millions and millions of years. And therefore, we consider them non-renewable resources. Energy resources vary greatly in their net energy. What is the net energy? The net energy is the amount of energy available from a resource minus the amount of energy needed to make it available. And that's what we're going to talk about a bunch in this lecture, the net energy between these different types of non-renewable resources. Again, um, some are very good, some are very bad, and we need to talk about that energy efficiency because we want to uh, have the greatest amount of energy efficiently uh, efficiency possible uh, in order not to waste uh, our resources. All right, so where does the energy we use come from? Uh, energy that heats the earth comes from the sun. So believe it or not, all that uh, oil and gas and everything, uh, if you trace its, its energy back to its original form, where does it come from? It comes from the sun because what is oil? What is gas? It's basically organic matter that has been decomposing and has been compressed over millions and millions of years, organic matter like plants and animals and things like that. And where does the energy come from to create the plants and animals? Well, it comes from the sun. So again, indirectly, uh, all this energy we're talking about does uh, does come from the sun in one form or another. Uh, commercial energy, though, sold in the marketplace. Again, we have the non-renewable side, oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear energy we consider non-renewable. And then we have renewable energy, soil, uh, solar, hydro, power, biomass, geothermal, and wind, and more on renewable uh, energy coming up uh, in a different chapter down the road. So 
Taking a look here, we're looking at energy use by source. Uh, the world is on the left. The United States is on the right. Uh, what you'll notice is the world uses a little more coal than we use. Uh, we use a little more natural gas and oil uh, as compared to the rest of the world. A renewable kind of about the same. We use a little more nuclear power than the world, uh, but we also use a little less hydro power as compared, uh, as, as compared to the world. Um, we use more solar wind wind and biomass, geothermal, uh, compared to the world. But uh, so again, you'll notice here, uh, we're going to talk about uh, all of these um, types of uh, energy as we go through this chapter. And then, of course, we'll talk about renewable energy in another chapter. Uh, but again, here's the breakdown. All right, world use on the left and um, U.S. use on the right. All right, so net energy. Again, let's talk about this, uh, what this is all about. Net energy is it takes energy to get energy, right? So again, net energy is the amount of energy left after you subtract the amount of energy it takes to actually create the energy that you're going to use. So each step in making energy available uses high quality energy. Example, oil must be found, pumped, transferred to a refinery, converted to gasoline, and then delivered to consumers. So all of that takes high quality energy, right? So each step in the making of, of oil, uh, and you need an input of high quality energy. So the net energy yield is going to be the amount of high quality energy available from a resource minus the high quality energy needed to make the energy available. Okay. So obviously what we want is the highest net energy yield we can get, right? We want to get a lot of this energy, but we don't want to use a lot of energy to, to create that energy, right? So that's kind of the key that we're going to be looking for uh, as we go through the slides here. What is that net energy yield of those different types of non-renewable energy sources. The net energy ratio, also called the energy returned on investment, is the energy obtained per unit energy used to attain it. So kind of the same thing, um, just bringing it down to a, to a, to a per unit. Uh, and the energy efficiency is getting more useful work using less energy, right? So heating buildings, producing electricity, driving more efficient cars. Basically, we want to get the, we want to have more energy by using less energy, right? We want to get more useful work done by using less energy. That increases our energy efficiency. And again, that's what we want uh, as we go through uh, this 21st century, right? We want to try to get that energy efficiency up so that we can stop using as much uh, of our energy sources. So you'll notice here, these are uh, types of, of, of net energy. Um, so you'll notice um, electricity, um, just type some type of your uh, energy efficiency. So net energy yield is rather high. That's good. Hydropower, high. Wind, coal is high. You'll notice nuclear fuel actually has a no uh, low net energy because it takes so much energy to produce nuclear fuel. Um, for instance, when we look at space heating, um, Things like solar, right, natural gas are going to have a medium net energy yield, while things like uh, heavy shale oil, we'll talk about in a little bit, going to have a low net energy yield, meaning it takes a lot of energy to produce not as much energy uh, as, let's say, something with a high net energy yield. Uh, looking at high temperature industrial heat, again, coal, high net energy yield. You keep seeing that. Coal is an interesting, uh, interesting type of uh, non-renewable energy because it has one of the highest net energy yields around, but it's one of the most dirtiest when it comes to polluting the atmosphere. So this is the uh, where the trade-offs are going to be, right? We, we coal is good because you, you get a lot of energy. It doesn't cost a lot to to burn to create coal or at least to get it out of the ground and to use it. The problem is it's very very dirty. So again, we'll talk more about that. Uh, while something like um, for something like uh, let's say shale oil, still dirty, maybe not as dirty as coal, uh, but has a low net energy yield because it takes a lot of energy to get that shale oil out of the oil sands. And we'll talk about that in just a couple of slides. Again, looking at your transportation, again, high net energy yield for gas. So that's good. Uh, you'll notice diesel has a medium. Um, and again, you'll notice as we start going down, for instance, ethanol from corn, everyone thought that was going to be the greatest new thing, but actually has a very low net energy yield because it takes a lot of energy to grow all that corn, right? We talked about that in the previous chapter, high put, high input industrialized agriculture, right? So we're putting in a wasting a lot of energy to produce this ethanol from corn. Uh, so in, in the end, 
it really has a low energy yield. So while it may be cleaner than, let's say, coal, for instance, or gasoline, uh, when it comes to the net energy yield, uh, ethanol is rather low. So again, these are the things that you guys going into uh, going into the workforce, if you get into this type of uh, type of work, maybe you could come up with uh, more efficient ways to use some of these cleaner uh, these cleaner uh, forms of energy. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about oil. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using oil? So conventional crude oil is abundant, all right? We do have a lot of it, uh, and it gives us a medium net energy yield. So it's not high, but it's not low. It's kind of in the middle. It does cause air and water pollution, and it does release a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Unconventional heavy oil from oil shale, shale rock and oil sands, I'll show you what that looks like in a second, we have potential potentially large supplies. However, there is a low net energy yield at this point because it takes a lot of energy to extract uh, the heavy oil from the oil shale rock and the oil sands. In addition, you have a higher environmental impact uh, when you're talking about extracting uh, heavy oil. So uh, here is your trade-offs, right? There may be a lot of this stuff available, but the, the, the energy yield is low. You have high environmental impacts. Uh, so maybe conventional crude oil, uh, again, is the way to go, at least comparing the two here uh, when you come to comparing that with the heavy oil. Crude oil is, is, is something known as petroleum. This contains con con combustible hydrocarbons. Uh, peak production is the time after which production from a well begins to decline. Again, these are just some terms for you. Uh, crude oil cannot be used as it comes out of the ground, so crude oil must be refined using high quality energy uh, into petrochemicals. You get some byproducts uh, of that crude oil as well. So, uh, Again, here are the yin and the yang, kind of the good and the bad uh, that, that comes uh, with using oil. But again, we depend heavily on that oil. What we're looking at here is uh, crude oil refined. Basically, how crude oil is refined is it's refined in, with a distilling process. Uh, you remember dist distillation from the last unit was the uh, evaporation of salt water, then condensed into fresh water. Well, the same thing here. Uh, you actually evaporate um, some of this uh, some of these other components out of the crude oil as it is at it as it is refined. Uh, so you'll notice the hood, the. the crude oil is heated, and then the lowest boiling point comes out first, right? Highest boiling point would come out last, and that's basically how uh, how this oil is refined. So you'll notice uh, the gasoline that we use, kind of a lower boiling point. Diesel oil has a higher boiling point, and then things like grease and wax or asphalt uh, comes out of that crude oil with the highest boiling point. So it's actually a distillation process uh, that we use uh, to actually refine uh, these the crude oil. And again, those are your boiling points from, from lowest to highest. Here we're just looking at an oil refinery in the state of Texas uh, that is doing basically what I just showed you uh, in that on that last slide, refining uh, that crude oil. So is the world running out of crude oil? Well, we do have proven oil reserves and available deposits. The problem is 12 OPEC countries have 81% of the world's proven crude oil reserves. Uh, these countries play a role in regulating global prices by agreeing to increase or decrease the amount produced. So these are mostly our Middle Eastern countries, right? They have 81% of the world's proven uh, crude oil. So while we have the crude oil there, uh, you know, we have to deal with other countries. And this is where uh, potentially a security and national security interests begin to, to pop into play because we need oil, right? Uh, and 81% of the world's proven oil reserves are controlled by these 12 countries, uh, the United States not being one of them. Uh, so again, this is uh, some of the issues that we talk about when we want to talk about an energy independence. Again, uh, maybe, it's not good to have to deal with uh, these countries uh, that have all this uh, crude oil. Maybe we need to figure this out uh, ourselves by either finding oil reserves here in the U.S. somewhere or figuring out alternative forms of energy, uh, maybe those more renewable forms, which again, we'll talk about in another chapter. Uh, increasing shortage of cheap oil, though, easy to reach deposits are quickly being depleted. So again, that is going to, inc or, or going to decrease the net energy yield of oil over time because as it gets more expensive to get the deposits out, uh, again, you're going to need more energy, which will reduce the net energy yield you're going to get from oil. Uh, here are, again, oil production and consumption. Um, here are your proven reserves, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Canada, 
production, Saudi Arabia or uh, Russia, United States, and, and uh, consumption, United States uses the most, China and Japan coming next. But you'll notice, where are the reserves? Venezuela, Saudi Arabia. All right. So again, we have to deal with uh, with, with with these countries. Some of them aren't necessarily as friendly as uh, to us as others. And this is where you get into that uh, national security uh, issue when it comes to uh, when it comes to oil. All right. Case study, oil production and consumption in the United States, U.S. Uh, commercial energy sources, 82 percent from fossil fuels, with, again, the largest portion coming from that crude oil. U.S. oil consumption exceeds domestic production, meaning we must import oil. Right. So we're not producing enough in the U.S. to uh, to satisfy the amount that we are consuming. So that means we must import. And the recent rise in domestic production of tight oil from Shell Rock has helped. Uh, but unfortunately, it's probably peaking right around now, uh, and then it, it is uh, forecast to decline. So again, we do have some of that tight oil from the share rock that we can get out, um, and that has increased in, in, in some domestic production, uh, but again, uh, not going to be enough for us. So that's why we neither need to import oil or again, figure out a, a different way to fuel ourselves. So again, here are some trade-offs. Uh, you know this chart by now, these types of charts, conventional oil, advantages, disadvantages. Uh, so advantages ample supply for several decades. Net energy is medium, but again, decreasing because we have to go further down to get the supplies. So it's going to be, take more money uh, to get these oil supplies out of the ground. You actually do have low land disruption uh, when you get these oil uh, oil because you just kind of drill in a, a little hole into the ground. So you're not really disrupting the land. And you got an efficient distribution system, right? It's been set up uh, over the last uh, 50 to 100 years. Disadvantages of conventional oil, water pollution from oil spills and leaks, environmental costs not included in the market price, releases carbon dioxide and other air pollutions, uh, pollutants when burned, and vulnerable to international supply interruptions. Again, we need to import from other countries. We have to rely on those other countries, and therefore uh, there could be some uh, international supply interruptions. All right, so let's talk about this, this heavy oil. The problem is, while we have a lot of this heavy oil around, especially in Canada, uh, this heavy oil is, again, costs a lot to get out, and it, it it really has high uh, environmental impact. So we don't think this is really the way to go. But what is shale oil? Oil that is integrated within bodies of shale rock. So again, that's that shale rock that I talked to you about in layers, right? In between the layers is this oil. Um, this is opposed to being trapped between the layers and rock. So let me just uh, ref uh, uh, step back here for a second. Again, in the natural gas, the hydrofracking, uh, the gas is trapped between the rock. Here, the oil is integrated into the shale rock, okay? So you almost have to wring the rock out to get the oil to drip out. You can kind of think of it that way. So it production involves mining, crushing, and then heating the rock, which extracts the kerogen that then can be distilled into the oil. So that's basically how it happens. So again, hydrofracking, the oil or the natural gas is trapped between the rock. We crack the rock open and retrieve the gas. For this heavy oil, this shale oil, it's integrated into the rock. So again, we got to mine it, crush it, and heat the rock to kind of ooze the oil out of the rock. And again, that's going to cost money, and that's why it has a low net energy yield. So on the left is the shale rock. On the right is the heavy oil. Uh, and again, this comes from this, okay? When you squeeze that, it kind of gets that heavy oil out. So again, there's a lot of it, but it costs a lot. And you basically have to strip mine your land in order to get this, uh, this shale rock out with the oil. So again, oil sands, tar sands are another source of heavy oil, uh, contains bitumen, uh, extensive deposits in Canada. So this, instead of uh, having this rock, this is just oil sand. That again, you can 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 mine, you can uh, compact and 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 melt, and then you can get the oil out of this sand. Uh, but again, the extraction—you got to clear cut forest and strip mine the land, and for what? A low net energy yield, because again, it takes a lot of energy to get this uh, heavy oil out. It requires much water, which then gets gets polluted. We talk about talked about fresh water in the previous chapter and how there's 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 a uh, 
you know, we need more fresh water, right? This requires water. And again, it emits pollutants. So there's a lot of issues uh, when you're extracting this heavy oil. And here again is what we're looking at. This is uh, oil sands surface mining in Alberta, Canada. Uh, you'll notice you have to not only, uh, we not only had to clear cut the, the boreal forest here, but we then had to strip mine the land. So it is a killer uh, from an environmental standpoint. Again, there's a lot of this heavy oil around, especially in Canada. Canada is a real friendly country to us, right? They're our neighbors. Uh, but unfortunately, again, uh, you're getting a low net energy yield and you're really destroying the environment when you talk about this heavy oil from either the shale rock or right from the oil sand. So advantages, again, large potential supplies, easily transported efficient distribution system in place, disadvantages, low net energy, it's expensive, it still releases carbon dioxide and other pollutants, you have a severe land disruption, and again, water pollutant, pollution and high water use needed uh, to get the heavy oil out of the shale rock and the oil sand. So again, just understand uh, this, uh, hopefully we're going to migrate away from this over the next uh, 50 to 100 years, uh, and again, these are the reasons uh, why we maybe should. All right, moving on now, we'll talk about natural gas. That'll be the last part of, of part one, and then we'll move into the other non-renewable resources, uh, uh, energy resources in, in part two. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of using natural gas? Well, natural gas is, is mostly methane, uh, but there is propane, butane, and hydrogen sulfide in smaller amounts. It has a me medium net energy yield and a fairly low production cost. So again, we're not getting a high net energy yield, but definitely not a low, so it's the yield is definitely better. It burns cleaner than oil and coal. So again, while it's not perfectly clean like solar or hydropower or something like that, uh, definitely burns cleaner. And again, it's, it, it's extracted through that horizontal drilling or that fracking, that, that hydro fracking uh, that we talked about earlier in this lesson. Uh, natural gas is a versatile and widely used fuel. There's basically two types, liquefied petroleum gas called LPG, which is stored in pressurized tanks for use in rural areas. And then there's liquefied natural gas, NLG, which can be transported across oceans unfortunately, a low net energy yield for the liquefied uh, natural gas. Uh, but the United States actually currently exports this stuff uh, to other nations as we have a little bit of an excess of this natural gas. Uh, again, right next door, Pennsylvania uh, has, has a lot of natural gas uh, in, in the shale rock. And actually parts of upstate New York uh, have it as well. Um, not necessarily here, but you go um, into the Finger Lakes region uh, and things like that. Um, out in western New York, uh, they have a lot of this natural gas. So again, your trade-offs, conventional natural gas adv advantages. We have enough supply. It's a versatile fuel, right? It can be used in a number of different ways. Its net energy yield is medium, so not too bad. And it does emit less carbon dioxide and other air pollutants than fossil fuels when burned. Disadvantages, the LNG does have a low net energy yield. Uh, production and delivery may emit more carbon dioxide and methane than the energy produced than coal. So uh, production of it may actually put more uh, pollutants in the air than, than, than coal. And we'll talk about coal in part two. Coal is very, very dirty. Fracking uses and pollutes large amounts of water. We spoke about that, how you need the water to, to basically break up the rock to get the gas out. Well, you're going to use large, large amounts of that water and it's going to pollute the water. Uh, and then potential groundwater pollution may happen because of that fracking. So again, these are some of the issues, advantages, disadvantages from using that conventional natural gas. So Science focus, uh, environmental effects of natural gas production and fracking in the U.S. Fracking does have several harmful environmental effects. It does require enormous volumes of water. It produces that hazardous wastewater, uh, and earthquakes could actually release that, uh, uh, release that into the groundwater. And the failure of well casing cements can cause contaminated contamination of that groundwater. So usually that that slurry, that polluted slurry I talked about, is usually uh, in in some kind of cement, they, they case it in, but if that cement fails, well, then you're going to contaminate the groundwater. Uh, natural gas fracking ex excluded from many EPA regulations back in uh, 2005. So again, we don't have a lot of ways to actually control it. And something like this could happen. So what's going on here? This is actually natural gas fizzing from a faucet in Pennsylvania. Uh, the company that is in that was fracking in the area 
does not de denies that they had anything to do with this. But basically what has happened is with the fracking, you release that gas. Well, that some of that gas has actually gone into the water supply. So now as this lady taps the water, right, coming out of the ground, she can actually light the water on fire because there's actually natural gas in the water. Uh, and again, the company that was doing the fracking says they had nothing to do with this. How the hell? How the heck? How the heck? How the heck else is that going to get? Uh, is that going to get into the water? That natural gas? I guess it could have uh, happened naturally, uh, but it most likely did not. Most likely, what had happened is as this company went down, went down there and broke open the shale with the water, right, uh, to release the natural gas and to extract it. Some of that natural gas wasn't extracted, got into the groundwater, into the aquifers, and now coming into this woman's house uh, through this tap water. And again, she's lighting it on fire. So. Again, these are just some of the uh, environmental effects uh, of natural gas production and fracking that could have in the United States. So can natural gas help to slow climate change? This is the key because we figured, hey, look, it burns uh, it burns cleaner than coal and oil. So maybe this is the way to go, right? It emits less CO2 per unit of energy than coal. Low price could slow the shift to other renewable energy resources, though. So again, maybe it doesn't. So the first one will help, but the second one, because natural gas has a rather low price and we're not really uh, adding in those environmental costs, right, uh, that could slow our shift to hot, uh, wind power or water power or things like that. So maybe that doesn't help slow a climate change. And methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and drilling production and distribution of natural gas releases large quantities of methane. So in the long run, while natural gas is definitely better than coal and oil, uh, it may not be the saving grace for us as maybe we thought it would be uh, 20 to 40 years ago as we're finding out uh, these other issues uh, involved uh, in, in natural gas and in the production and extraction of that natural gas. All right, so that concludes part one of my lecture on chapter 13, no, uh, excuse me, chapter 14 we're on now, non-renewable energy. Stay tuned for part two, and as always, thanks for listening.